It was another news-packed week. In fact, it's still going on, and we have Shields and Salam to unpack it. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and National Review Executive Editor Raihan Salam. David Brooks is away. Gentlemen, welcome on this Friday. So, Mark, I want to point out we've just learned there is a Washington Post story uh, just moving that uh, the Attorney General let the White House know last weekend that if the President were to fire the Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, that he, uh, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, would have to step down. Uh, I guess the language is might have to leave his job. So. Uh, it looks as if there's still worry, concern about the president's intentions, even though he said he doesn't plan to fire these people. It's a happy, productive place to work, the uh, Trump administration. I mean, feeling of uh, uh, conviviality, trust, congeniality, um, and mutual sense of mission. I mean, uh, as, a, as a personnel director, the, the president is unrivaled. As a uh, as a disaster in the profession, people who work for him are work so in terror, uh, anxiety, uh, unsure of what he wants to do and what they're supposed to do, um, and whether they'll be there uh, two weeks from now. Raihan, it's just another element uh, in this ongoing saga. I can't say I know exactly where the story is here. Were we to actually hear that there's some move to fire the deputy attorney general, that would be very big news. Mm -hmm. There would be very intense resistance from many Republican lawmakers, uh, as well as many other figures in the senior ranks of the White House. So I I'm not sure there's a story here yet, but certainly it's a sign that there are many people in the White House who would strongly discourage the president from taking such a step, and he himself has said that he has no intention of pursuing it. So we'll see what happens. Right. I think this was probably in the wake of that. It was in, in that several-day period when we were hearing the president was very upset and was thinking about or talking about firing. Uh, but as you said, nothing's happened yet. So let's move, Mark, to the story today. Democratic National Committee announces it is filing a lawsuit against the Trump campaign, against high Russian officials, the Russian government, and WikiLeaks. Uh, for hacking into the, the uh, Democratic National Committee uh, email system and essentially for stealing, they're saying, uh, uh, corrupting the election in 2016. We heard Tom Perez a few minutes ago, the chair of the party, say, well, one of the reasons we're doing this is the statute of limitations. We think we, there's evidence uh, to believe there was a conspiracy. Or is it a smart move on their part? Well, we'll find out if it's a smart move, Judy. I mean, part of uh, the problem is that uh, it does have echoes of, of Watergate, uh, and uh, without, without right now, at least the persuasive proof uh, that the same set of facts operated where the president was intimately, deeply involved in a criminal act. Um, I, I'd say this. Part of it is, uh, I think, politics has become litigation. Uh, politics has become lawyers and uh, and depositions and whether you're going to testify and um, you know in that sense it's it's not uh, at least initially exhilarating uh, to those of us who care about uh, politics and policy and legislation and uh, righting wrongs and, and and bringing justice. I mean, but you know that, that I can honestly say I don't know. What do you make of it? What's the significance? Well, politics is becoming litigation, certainly, but politics is also fundraising. That is especially true if you're the chair of the Democratic National Committee. One thing that's important to understand is that American politics is very decentralized. Typically, candidates raise their own money. They have their own networks. For the Democratic National Com uh, Committee to be influential and important, it has to raise money. And one way for the DNC to raise its profile is to do things along these lines that really fires up the base and the small-dollar donors many of whom are very passionate about the Russia story. Susan Hennessy, earlier on this program, explained that they are setting a very high bar for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see that they're really going to prove these allegations in court, mm -hmm. but the litigation is definitely going to get the DNC and DNC chair Tom Perez in the news, and I think that it's going to fire up a ton of people to open up their checkbooks. So in that sense, I think it is a very shrewd move for the DNC. So for Democrats more broadly, we'll see. So, so, excuse me, I, was, I, I didn't want to let you finish your thought. All this coming, Mark, in a week when we're hearing so much about uh, James Comey, his book, and then today, or last night, I guess, the, uh, after urging by Republicans on, on Capitol Hill, the Comey memos uh, that he wrote after his conversations with the president before Comey was fired mm -hmm. have now been made public. You've had a chance, both of you have had a chance to look at them. Do they change anything? Uh, I, I can't, other than... Perhaps your opinion of uh, uh, of the three chairmen 
who push for their publication. I mean, they, they in no way uh, conflict, uh, at least in my reading of them, with uh, James Comey's uh, own testimony. Uh, they, they reinforce what he said and what he has written. Um, there, now, uh, I think uh, Congressman Gowdy has uh, said that they're Exhibit A for the defense uh, for the White House uh, for any case of uh, obstruction of justice uh, on the part of the president. Uh, they're, they're certainly not uh, uh, complimentary of the president. Uh, they're not inspiring, uh, but they do reinforce what, uh, what Comey has said. What do you see there, Ryan? And also the, with the book, I mean, coming out the same week as the book. I mean, as Mark said, the, most people are saying they, they, uh, they are, are affirming what's in the book. I agree with Mark's uh, remarks. I think that uh, basically this is entirely consistent with what James Comey had said before. Clearly, James Comey had serious misgivings about President Trump uh, long before he was elected. Uh, and also, it's, you know, now he's opening campaigning against President Trump's reelection. He's telling people that he wants American voters to throw him out. And the trouble here is this. If you're James Comey and you really want to convince folks that President Trump should be voted out of office, et cetera. The thing is that you have to find persuadable people. You have to find people who might be favorably mm -hmm. disposed to the president right. and persuade them not to be. And the thing is that I'm not sure he's really doing that. What he, we know now is that he's always had misgivings about the president. So I think that that tends to reinforce this narrative that, you know, he, he was not favorably disposed. How do you see that? I, I will say this about James Comey, uh, and he's certainly gotten criticism uh, from a number of quarters, and I think he's earned it uh, by including the, the rather snide remarks about the president's appearance and uh, sun tanning and uh, hair color and all the rest of it, um, which, which was petty. It was mud wrestling, getting down with, with, with Donald Trump mud wrestles. But do, by his statement, un, uncontradicted in any way, uh, before the election, he revealed that uh, Hillary Clinton's uh, personal uh, emails uh, were going to be reopened uh, at a time when he and uh, virtually everybody in shoe leather and the majority of the people in the Trump campaign firmly believed that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And he put that election in some suspense. The Clinton people blame him for it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Trump people acknowledge what he did. And I, I have to say, uh, it, it, it certainly was not, it was an act of, of some integrity, professional integrity, for him to do that. The safe thing would have been to not, to not say anything at the time um, and, uh, in fact, let it happen uh, and be reappointed. He was certainly putting at jeopardy his own position uh, if, in fact, Hillary Clinton did win, uh, that uh, she, he had tried to sabotage and submarine her chances in the last week of the campaign. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think... Right now, Judy, what we've seen in the first week is that the two tribes have formed. Uh, on one side, uh, those who uh, don't believe uh, James Comey uh, and those who do. I don't know how many people are persuadable on this issue at this point. I want to ask you both, uh, finally, about um, uh, uh, former First Lady Barbara Bush, who um, was a remarkable figure, uh, somebody with a sense of humor, passed away this week. Uh, her funeral is tomorrow. Uh, Raihan, why do you think there's been such a, it seems to me, I mean, there would have, of course, been a lot of attention, but why do you think there's particular attention right now? Well, I have a little theory, which is that a lot of us have women in our lives, particularly mothers and grandmothers who came of age at a time when women's contributions weren't necessarily all that valued. And the way that women made their mark was in part by uh, serving their families, uh, putting others ahead of themselves. And I think a lot of people look to Barbara Bush and see a very formidable woman, a very sharp-tongued mm -hmm. uh, woman with an acid wit and also a lot of warmth who really helped build a political dynasty, was an incredibly important part of that, who didn't necessarily get all the spotlight that she would have gotten otherwise, maybe had she come of age at a different time. So I think that that resonates with a lot of folks. They see that this was a major talent uh, who really had a, a pretty big and deep effect on the country. She was a, Mark, she was a wife and a mother, a mother of a president, the wife of a president. Right. Uh, we followed her over s decades. Uh, so she played the traditional role, as Raihan said, but she did it with very much her own identity. She did, and, and her, her death has, I, I think, touched something in the nation. That, that has surprised me. I mean, I think the, the response has been national. Um, I, I think there's a couple of factors, Judy. At a time when the debate about character and, and fitness for office and the president rages and continues to rage in the country, um, she reminds us, uh, as does her husband, 
uh, of, a, of a time when noblesse oblige, that sense of moral obligation of those of advantage, those of privilege, to act generously and compassionately toward those not so gifted, not so uh, blessed, uh, was central to, uh, uh, to our national leadership. Um, at the same time, I remember in, in Ryan's points about she was, she did have an acid tongue, she was uh, capable of that, but um, I, I remember the act of courage, uh, the time when the AIDS epidemic, we had, we were seized oh, in this country yeah. by ignorance and by fear. Uh, if you shook hands with somebody with AIDS, you could contact the... Uh, back in the, the 1980s. You know, that's right. And, and uh, her predecessor, Ronald Reagan, the Reagans had been uh, more than arm's length on this issue. And um, in fact, uh, she left the White House and went to Grandma's house, which is a hospice for infants afflicted with AIDS, and held and, and caressed and comforted children. And it was it was an act of just enormous courage. But I, you know, I, I just think we, we yearn. There's a yearning for what they represented. I mean, the the marriage, the family, that sense of duty, the sense of responsibility that each of us has to our country. And I, I think she just touched it. And we have gotten away from that, haven't we? we certainly have. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we certainly think of her, we think of the entire Bush family at this moment. Thank you both. Raihan Salam, Mark Shields. Thank you, Judy.